Well, hello, sports fans. You guessed it. It's that time again. It's Athletics Chat 22. We should have that. Stuart, I really think we need to have, like, the pulsating yeah. stuff. Michael, can you do that for us? Okay. Um, so this is Athletics Chat 22. Here's the drill. Stuart Weir, the handsome man in the blue sweater, sitting in that learned library. He's in Oxford, England, the intellectual capital of the world. I'm in the Silicon Valley. This is Larry Eater, San Jose, California, Willow Glen area, in the backyard with hummingbirds flying around and chirping birds and like six dozen lizards. Some of them get up on the table and talk to me with a British accent like those Geico commercials we have over here. But I've digressed. Stuart, hello. Good evening. Hello. Yeah, it's evening here and it's dark and it's, uh, uh, it's cold. Look at that. Wow, Ooh, that's really dark. dark. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. light out here. Yeah, I'm in the backyard, and it's about, well, it's supposed to be 100 degrees today, so I've got the fan on, but I'm enjoying the backyard for a while, while I can. Yeah. Um, we've got many topics to discuss today, my friend. It's been a very busy week in athletics, but we're going to begin with you singing praise to Michelle Carter, shot diva. Olympic gold medalist, and it's her birthday. She's 35. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, mean, I, I have enjoyed watching Michelle, I suppose, for the first time, perhaps I remember, we'll go back to about 2012, when she uh, took a silver at uh, Istanbul, Istanbul at the World Indoors, mm -hmm. uh, came fourth in the London Olympics, then got her Olympic gold medal in Rio, uh, had a home gold medal at the World Indoors in Portland. But the thing that I always tease Michelle about is that both at Portland and at Rio, she won it with the last throw. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she gets her money's worth. She doesn't go out there and win it early. She just has this ability to produce the throw when she needs it to win the big one. And well done her. Yeah, now she's, a, she's a tremendous competitor. Uh, I learned very early to watch her last two throws. Mm -hmm. She has this uncanny ability to put it together and to keep it together under pressure. That's one of the things I love about the shot book, mm. men and women's. Um, and uh, a, a very happy, happy birthday to Michelle Carter, the shot diva. She uh, does a lot of things on social media. She does a lot to support the sport, and we respect that. Stuart? And am I not right in thinking, and I didn't have time to look this up, that she and her dad both represented the U.S., in the shop for the Olympics. Yes, uh, her dad still has the American high school record in the shot. I saw him compete in 84. I also watched him play as a San Francisco 49er American football. Mm. Um, and he was a very, very humble man. Um, he didn't like people talk, really talking about him. When he got out there to throw, he threw, and I believe he coached her for much of her. Yeah, he did. He did yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he would. I, I would love to find the time. Maybe I can see if I can get Michelle and her dad to talk shot with us. I mean, the other two I want to get is, um, oh God, um, Vashti Cunningham and her dad Randall uh, to mm. talk. Uh, I've interviewed mm. Vashti, and she's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And her dad, I'm fascinated with going from being a technical, again, American football player to working, um, teaching his daughter how to be one of the best high jumpers in the world, you know? So, but well, uh, being a church pastor in his spare time. Yes. Yeah. I tell you, he's, he's, you know, he, he's got all the good things going, but Michelle yeah. Carter, happy birthday, happy 35th. Although my mother said that a woman never admits that she's over 39. So for 41 years, I sent my mother a happy 39th birthday, number 36, number 37, just to kind of stir it up a little bit. So got to have a few chuckles. But again, happy birthday, Michelle. Yeah. We miss 
seeing you compete this year. We look forward to seeing you next year, and we'll say nice things about you, okay? Yeah. So we go on. The relaunch of Athletics Weekly. Tell us about that, dear friend, because we don't know much about what's going on. Well, Athletics Weekly, as the name suggests, is a weekly magazine, but it isn't. That it is relaunched as a monthly magazine. Wow. It closed down uh, for lockdown because uh, they, they couldn't sustain it. Uh, but it's come back, it's got new owners. It's now owned by a magazine publisher, the mm. name of which I've forgotten. It used to be owned, of course, by the Great Run com uh, Company. Yeah. But it's, it's now owned by... Uh, Twenty one six sport. And who? Anybody do we know involved there? Well, is it, no, I don't think so. I think they they just do magazines. But the the team is still there. Um, Wendy Sly um, has transferred across as the managing director, and they still right. have Jason as editor, Ewan as publishing director, and Jeff as um, all the online stuff. And I mean, as well as the published, the printed magazine, they have uh, the website, they have a digital edition of the magazine, and they now have something called the Clubhouse, which is a, subs a subscription. Um, That's what that meant. I was trying website. to figure out how they were doing that because I was watching some things on Facebook. Um, are, now, are you still writing for them? Yes, yes. Awesome, awesome. No, I love. AW, I have uh, all the issues from 1966 till 1990 in my garage in Wisconsin, mm. protected mm. Uh, in a, uh, not a humidor, but in a, um, mm. a, a weather protecting kind of a thing because uh, yes, we, every once in a while I like to pull them out. We've been going for 75 years, and some wow. people wondered if it would actually come back after its... Uh, it's um, fiesta for, for lockdown, but it's great to have it back uh, yeah. as a monthly. The, um, now, digitally, will it continue weekly, or will it do a monthly as well? I think, uh, I, well, I, the actual digital will just be a, is a copy of the magazine, which is which you get okay, online. Cheers. But okay. instead of getting the quotes from the athlete, you get sometimes the video of the athlete yeah. actually speaking. Uh, but but the website and the clubhouse are being updated weekly. Or That's daily. excellent. That's fantastic. Mm. Um, well, we wish Athletics Weekly the very best. Love the crew. I've known Wendy for a long, long time. She's always very cheerful, and it's the perfect job for her. Uh, Jason is a wonderful editor, and uh, Jess, we dearly love. She is um, always got a smile on her face. And wow, do Jason and her work at the events. Um, and they've got some great supportive writers too. So we wish them the best. And if you're in the UK, subscribe. Okay, if you're a real track athlete, you should be subscribing to that. Um, and if you're a real track fan. Okay, so our next topic is Scottish Athletics Awards. So tell me about that. Well, they've just had the Scottish Athletics Awards. Um, had to be virtual because, of course, you're not allowed to meet together like that. And so, a bit of a challenge for them to choose the athlete of the year. Okay. So, they've cheated really? and given it jointly to Laura Muir, Jake Whiteman, and Gemma Ricci. Uh, Jake, for his 329.47 in Monaco. Yep. Plus, uh, which, which, means that he's now faster than three British athletes, a certain co Obert and Cram. Yes. He's now faster than them. Uh, Ricky um, had five 800-meter races this summer in four countries, all of them under two minutes, and she won four of them. And she won two out of three 1500s as well, whereas Laura Muir ran three 1500s, all of them, uh, under four minutes. Uh, and she, she did five 800s, of which the slowest was 20049. So 
pretty good performances by those oh, three yeah. Scottish athletes. That's fantastic. Now they're they're also, all. But I just have to say that also in a year where a lot of people just chose not to compete, those yeah. three were very intentional about what they were going to do. And interestingly, Laura and Gemma, a bit like the male sprinters, one might say. Uh, tended not to run against each other, but to run in different races or in different places. I, I actually think that was quite astute of Andy Young, the coach. Mm -hmm. um, he has got two tremendous athletes, and he wants them to be, be comfortable working out with each other and competing when they have to. And so controlling that makes a lot of sense. And Gemma seems to... 10 towards the 800, uh, quite good at the 1500, but not at Laura's stage at the 1500. And Laura dabbles in the 800, quite yes. good. But right right now, Gemma's got a little more leg speed there. Um, Jake is coached by his father, uh, the announcer, Jeff Whiteman, who is a 215 marathoner. And... Um, Jake's mom was, I think, Susan Tooby. Is that yes. correct? And she was a, I remember her, about 240. Um, so he's in a running family. And what I like about Jake is he has an independence from his, uh, and a differing of thought from his father. And they found a way to make it work, like this summer. Yeah. Yeah. His dad didn't want him to race, mm -hmm. and he wanted to get some things in, and they figured a way to make it work. And I remember asking him, I've interviewed him about six or seven times, and each time he is probably the most relaxed athlete, Stuart, I've ever talked to. He's just a good guy. You know, he's a kid he that is. you'd sit down and have a pop with and uh, yeah. maybe play some darts. He'd probably play darts better than me. Maybe I could uh, challenge him in pool. Um, but but uh, he, we, we have these great conversations and it's been nice to watch him develop. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember when he was all excited about a 357 indoor mile and now he's, you know, he'll be in metal contention for the next eight years. Mm -hmm. The guy has got mm -hmm. wheels. That 800 coming down to 144.08, mm -hmm. you know, is pretty impressive, too. So congratulations there. Um, and then our next topic that you'd written down was Bianca Williams. What's going on there? Well, yeah, there's been a, there's been a, a development. I mean, we talked about how Bianca and her uh, partner had been stopped by the police. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Right out of the car, handcuffed and all that. Well... We have a body called the Independent Office for Police Conduct. Okay. And they have announced their preliminary inquiries is that five police officers involved in the incident should be investigated further. Oh, but wow. Bianca and uh, uh, um, uh, Ricardo De Santos, yeah. Portuguese athlete, uh, have come back and said they're really quite disappointed with this because it seems that uh, the press release that came out said that it's an issue of respect and courtesy, whereas they think it's an issue of dishonesty and racism. And as, as uh, Ricardo put it beautifully, polite racism is still racism. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, they are disappointed that, that the uh, they felt that there were some of the things that the police said lacked integrity uh, and that it seems that the investigating independent body is letting them away with it. But wow. I'm really impressed with the dignity with which they have uh, handled themselves uh, through this, this, this situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that you know, everything that I've read and what you've explained to me um, they're class acts, and they've really shown it under duress. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just remember the whole situation in 2011 when I was over um, 
when the riots were going on and some of the things that had happened there. And I was really taken aback because I thought the UK treated have, uh, treated various minorities, the various ethnic groups with much more respect than the US did. And for the most part, they do. Um, but there, there's issues. And um, I'm glad to see that this uh, in, um, this investigative body just come up and said, look, you got to look at these cops. Yeah. Most of the cops are pretty dang good in your country and ours. Yeah. The problem is there are people that are not. And what I don't like is them being protected. And that's an issue. Um, we have it over here much more than you have it in your country. And I think it's just because of the militarization of the police and also the whole the way we view guns is just very different um and it's sad um so we wish bianca the very best um yeah. you know it, it's uh it's been your black lives matter moment and there's probably been a few others that we don't know about and i always remember um linford christie very very spirited i always liked him i just thought he had a a, a swagger but an honesty about him that i you know, he and Maurice Green and that whole crew at that time, just you, you knew if you talked to them, you weren't going to get BS. And it may not be what you wanted to hear, but it was honest. And that's, uh, Lin Linford always said some good things and got us to think. Uh, unfortunately, not enough people thinking. Um, well, and of course, Lin Linford is, is uh, Ricardo's coach. I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just... Yeah, he's one of the guys I really want to interview. I haven't seen him since 1996, um, so he'd be one of the, he'd be a fun one to interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, so we had a couple world records last week. Yeah. Did you get, did you watch the show? I didn't, in fact. Um, now, am I being too much of a purist or old-fashioned? But I don't get that excited about these. We're going to run a world record and we're going to have 37 pacemakers who are taking it in turns uh, and all of that. And to me, that's completely different from when we see in a championship somebody who's there to win the gold medal and breaks the world record while doing that. Um, you, you are not uh, old fashioned. You may be a little more of a purist, but I respect that and welcome that. Um, the funny thing is, is that's what they purported to be giving us, Stuart, mm -hmm. but that's not what they gave us. And that's the weird thing. Mm -hmm. You recall that when athletes like Ron Clark, he broke like 35 world records in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. And when he went under 28 minutes for the first time, and the 10,000 meters, it was in Turku, Finland. And in order to get the 10,000 meter on the bill, he had a promise to get up the next day and run a 3,000 meters against the best in the world. So he gets into this 10,000, and I think Jim Hogan was in it. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty good group, but it was set up for him. I think he was paced through 4,000 meters, and he went the rest of the way on his own, Broke the world record, 27.39.8, I believe, and um, came back the next day and ran like the fourth best 3,000 ever, got beat. But that's what he would have to do. And, you know, he would do this. Clark's the man who the, the, in the summer season in Scandinavia was built around. He would go to Scandinavia, and he would go from city to city, country to country, and race. Um what the events reminded me of in in Valencia was, yes, they came out and they said, let's do world record days. And I thought that they would have this mechanize where they would have one pacer for one lap, one for two, one for three, one for four. In the women's race with Lensabeth Cadet, who had run 1423 for 5,000, world record was 1411. She was going to have to hightail it. 
she had a, um, they took a young Spanish runner, had her take her through 1K and 251, but then Beatrice Chepkowicz, the world record holder in the steeple, took her through the 3,000. And for the last 2K, Lensabet ran on her own. And those were the fastest uh, splits of the race. She ran 14.06. It was interesting, but there really was no competition. Second place was 15.59. And in fact, my issue, and we're giving this out, I, I haven't seen anybody else write about it, is that in the olden days, when you were trying to set an American record, a European record, a world record, you had to have three finishers in the race. I remember in 1979 in Saratoga, California, Bill Rogers came out and was going to break the world record at 25K. He ended up breaking the American record at 20K, uh, 25K, world record at 25K, started to jog, and they told him, you have to finish the whole 30K or your records don't count. So he ran six minute pace for three miles, still broke the American record. Three other guys finished, or two other guys finished, or he would not have gotten the records. But in Lensabet's race, only two people finished. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for that to be discussed because I don't recall the rules changing. All I've seen about the commentary has been um, that there hasn't, uh, that the, the new shoes, which yeah. apparently have been research so we'll have to see in the men's race um again um for the last half of the race he was by himself and um joshua chapter guy is a tremendous talent he's now got two of the world records that bekele ken and lisa bekele used to have mm -hmm. the the five and the ten mm -hmm. um they are making the records look easy i do believe the shoes have a big part in it the pacing, because it stopped at 5K, I'm not making many comments on it because the last 12 and a half laps of a 10,000 meter race, uh, and this comes from uh, life experience, is rather difficult. And if you're by yourself, you're in a no man's land. And Chepta Guy was. He is just so mentally strong and so physically strong that, I mean, he. His, his pace was, his 1,000 meter splits were, the difference was less than half a second between one and nine, and then he ran his last one the fastest. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were exciting, but like you, I'd rather see racing. I much more enjoyed the 10,000 meter in Doha where Yomif Kajelcha and Joshua Cheptegei were duking it out to the last... 20 meters that's what thrills me those are great events um the diamond league i would wish i would love to see them get more in, on the women's side like laura Muir runs fast races no matter where she is yeah. you know the, the yeah. but it doesn't happen in the men's races and uh, I don't think that's because of men's running being more, be more sophisticated. I think sometimes it's just, you know, crap. But um, I would rather see them go out there and put it all out uh, and see a real race. Um, I think that this season has been so strange with our modern plague that we're just, we just want to see stuff. And then on Saturday... Uh, I felt so bad for Safan Hassan. She broke the Paul Radcliffe's 10,000 meter record and she earned it is because it was ironic because when Paula set the record, she was in the reign at a European championships, I believe. Dad, um, they look terrible out there for Safan. Um, do the shoes help? I think her guts help. I think that she just ran really, really tough. The other races were, you know, Good times, but rather subpar for what we were expecting. Um, yeah. I think Yos Herms, Hermans gets a, a pat on the back for putting these things on. Uh, I think he'll have a quite good payday. <laughs> you know, I think it's $100,000 a world record. So uh, that's not a bad day in the woods. Uh, but now mm -hmm. what we've got is chapter guy is the, 
the world record holder in the five and ten. Now, can he win the big races? He's one of ten. Let's see what he can do in the five. Um, today is going to be the same thing. Everybody's going to be gunning for her. Uh, is she as good a racer as she is a world record runner? You know, um, the um, the pacemaking thing. I share your thoughts. There's times when. Um, Getting them out there, getting them on a good pace, that's okay. But the athletes have got to earn it. If, if they'd have stayed with them till two laps to go, I, I would have said, yeah, that's just out of control, you know. And uh, But we've had a problem with pacemaking going back to Roger Bannister. Uh, yeah. No one seems to recall that Roger ran a 402.65 mile that was never ratified, and it wasn't ratified because – and I believe it was Chris Brasher who allowed himself to be lapped. And then with the lap to go, he ran with Bannister for the last 300 meters. They took the record down from 408 to 402, but that 402 was not accepted. And the next accepted record was 359.4, where the pacing was done properly. You know, the guys finished, and one did one lap, one did two, one did three, and they finished. Um, purists have always kind of gone, yeah, let's just give us a race and give us, uh, uh, Chris yeah. Chataway and, and, uh, Vladimir Kutz under the lights yeah. in Crystal Palace, not Crystal Palace, but in uh, white city. Um, so you, you have those races. you any more thoughts on the, the whole idea of something being set up? Well, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, th I think I've written something on, on pacemakers because, um, there have been situations for pacemakers uh, have wanted to carry on running and try to win the race and been mm. told that they won't be paid if they do that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, I remember... I think, that, I think that is really not uh, not within the rules of the sport. Yeah. My understanding is if you're in a, if you're in a race, um, you can win it. Well, I recall, I think the first time that happened was with... Uh, well, David Moorcroft wasn't the pacemaker, but everybody thought he was because he went out so hard when he ran his 13-minute time, 13.048. And mo no one figured it out until the last minute, and they couldn't catch him. Um, the uh, Paul Pilkington, an American marathoner, was leading at 23 miles at L.A., and he was the pacemaker. And he had a mile lead, and he said, you know what? This is a $50,000 payday. So he finished and he won 50,000 bucks, you know? So, uh, this stuff happens. And, uh, I think, uh, who was it now? There was a, a Todd, um, gosh, there's an American 1500 mile guy. Um, he had that Adonis thing going for him. Actually looked like Albert Drew's drawings of Jesus Christ, but, uh, Oh, Tom Byers, uh, Tom, won a couple races like that. I mean, ran really fast, and people just didn't get it. Wow, what are you doing? But uh, I remember, go on, sorry, I was just going to say, I remember Jenny Meadows saying to me that she was surprised when she did a year of pacemaking when she had effectively retired, uh -huh. that at times she was actually getting paid more to pace than she would have got if she'd been an athlete in the race, finishing pretty high up. Well, I remember the American announcer, Lewis Johnson, telling me that, you know, he got paid to go to Europe several summers, and he was making serious bucks. Um, and I know that um, Jim Spivey, a, a world champ bronze medalist, told me that before he could get into races in Europe, he had to rabbit for a while, you know? And he made good bucks doing it, made more than he would in some of those races. Uh, okay. Because, again, yeah. that sets it up. And, and at the end of the day, these directors, remember, they're entertainers. Sports is entertainment, you know. Um, I think the meets have really gotten that point down. And I think that World Athletics can learn something from those meets. Mm -hmm. uh, having a, a fewer events, um, really highlighting some of them. I wish they would yeah. highlight more of the field things. I want to see mm -hmm. Brian Krauser... Uh, and, and uh, uh, Joe Kovacs are in phenomenal shape. And to see those two throw out against each other would be great. 
women's pole vaults like that, that men's pole vaults yeah. like that, you know? And, yeah. Um, yeah. and, you know, so is the triple jump. You know, you've got, you know, um, Pedrosa in Cuba, but you've also got the older gentleman from uh, Portugal, and then you've got Will Clay and Christian Taylor. So yeah. you, you get a whole group. Um, Evora, I think it's Nelson Evora. Oh, yeah, Nelson Evora. Yeah, yeah. And Nelson yeah. was 41 or 42, and you know Christian and Will, you know, at the um, at yeah. the at the World Champs thing, just thought he was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and that's respect. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the triple jump is so exciting that uh, we don't need it in the diamond leagues. Yeah, it's just that total. You know, there's times when. I think our sport needs an ombudsman. And what I mean is someone that can go to Seb, who can go to the Diamond League people and say, BS, you guys are taking yourself too seriously. You're taking an event that has tremendous historical, but also a lot of people love watching the triple jump. A lot of non-track fans look at this thing and they see the athleticism in it like they see yeah. American football, American football in your football, and go. I mean, Christian Taylor, Will Clay, those guys could play anything, man. They're they're tremendous. It's like the pole vaulters, you know. Who, who's the who's the best athletes out there? You know, it's just like I remember the year uh, was it 2014 when um, um, Mr. Eaton. Um, uh, decided to do the 400 hurdles and I was yeah. following him around meet to meet and he was in Glasgow and he ran his PB and I got him after the race I said why are you focusing on the hurdles he goes Larry I'm learning so much about myself and I'm learning so much about competing you know from a guy who's taking 10 events you know it was just mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. phenomenal you know um, but those are the things every once in a while, you know, it's uh, will play, will do the long jump sometimes and then I'll do the triple. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I find that taking the triple out was absolute the wrong thing to do. But, um, yeah. for whatever reason, our dear, um, okay. I think we are getting to, I have this, I have a suspicion because Michael's new thing isn't he can't tell me when our time's up, so I'm just going to put my little phone back on so he can send me a love note. Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, got that. I think we've been going for towards 35 minutes. Okay, so yeah, so you've survived almost 35 minutes. Any uh, deep thoughts right now, Stu? Well, no, I mean, it's... Um we're still in the same situation. COVID is getting worse here. Yeah. Um, I do desperately hope there will be a 2021 20, season, but it's it's at the moment hard to see it. Yeah. Yeah. No. I I uh, I uh, I think that I was really hoping to come to Europe for the indoor season. I will not go to the world indoor champs because I have no desire until they have a vaccine to go back to China, even though I know the U S uh, uh, brand of COVID they claim most of it came from a strain from Europe. Um, but our, our dear president likes to call it the Chinese virus, uh, which is a misnomer. We're just a, we're a global village. And those things happen now. We've just got to be careful, and I, I pray that um, that we come up with a vaccine. But Stuart, you and I know it's going to take all of next year to do that. I mean, I'm preparing myself that you know we will have a volume two of athletics chat, uh, which we'll do even if we're here or there. But I'm hoping to be able to get some meats and bother you a little bit with a cup of hot tea, you know. Mm. And, you know, you can give me a witticism or two, you know, because yeah. without that, you know, mm. you know, it's uh, our existence is just mere existence, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of existence, did you get to play golf this week? Um, yes, I did. Yes. Good, good, good. 
now do you do do you consider like if you just play nine holes is that satisfactory or do you need to go the whole 18. when i play with my son it's always 18 if i play with my wife it's often nine so either okay. is, is all right okay, now do you take mulligans uh, not with my son, because we're pretty serious. With my wife, we, we might. <laughs> I, I heard this. Now, there's about something. <laughs> what if we could introduce mulligans in, into athletics? I think that would be great. I think that in the field events, you should be allowed a mulligan. You know? Yeah. I don't know how we could do it in the running stuff, you know? But someone will come I, up I with that. So. Sometimes for somebody who's a medal contender who false starts in a prelim, I think that's always very harsh. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it, I just remember the look on Usain Bolt's face in Daegu. He yeah. knew what he had done. He yeah. didn't pretend. He didn't pout. He put on his vest and he got away. And yeah. he showed a lot of class. People gave him mm -hmm. a lot of distress over it. But you know what? He handled himself well in that situation. Um, so we are now down to one minute, Stuart. Thank you again for chatting. Please stay safe. Uh, enjoy the mulligans with your lovely wife and uh, the serious nature of the game of golf with your son. Um, I look forward to Athletics Chat 23. Do we have any meets that we're going to watch on TV this week? Is there anything going on? I don't think so. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I'll have to rewatch something then. But I'll come yeah. up with some topics and Good. stay safe, my friend. Thank you okay. again. Thank you. Talk Thank to you. you. Soon. Bye. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. Our program is uh, Athletics Chat. This was number 22. Thank you to Stuart Weir. Thank you to Mike Deering for putting up with me. Uh, this is Larry Eater saying if you like us, like us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And if you love us, subscribe to the YouTube. Larry Eater saying stay safe. Talk to you soon. Hey, sports fans, it's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is Athletics Chat 22, the epilogue. And uh, you know what athletics chats are about? Stuart Weir, who lives in Oxford, England, and has this killer office. He's got great bookshelves behind him. Um, he speaks from the intellectual capital of the world. I'm in San Jose, California. I speak from Silicon Valley. Um, in the backyard, I've got hummingbirds flying around. I've got all these lizards speaking like the lizard from Geico. They all have Brit British accents. I don't know why. Uh, and then I have little birds and other creatures. And my mom and dad just kind of made this like amazing menagerie back here. And uh, I, I'm here. My, my mom passed in 16. My dad uh, died this April. And I'm uh, helping get some of the stuff in the house uh, together for the family. So it's it's good to have uh, to appreciate the things that your family did for you and my parents moved here in 1974 from St. Louis and uh, raised us all here and uh, some of us are in California some of us in Nevada and one of us is in Wisconsin and that's me so I'm between Wisconsin and California so I digress so here we go here's what we got today first thing Happy 35th birthday to Michelle Carter, the gold medalist from Rio 2016 in the shot. Michelle, as many of us know, a.k.a. Shot Diva, is the daughter of uh, Michael Carter, high school record holder in the shot put, former 49er, Olympic medalist in the shot put. Good guy. And Michael has been Michelle's coach for a long, long time. Again, Michelle, you smile, you tell us jokes, you're patient with our questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep throwing, keep supporting the sport, and happy 35th birthday. Uh, next, the relaunch of Athletics Weekly. Athletics Weekly was launched in 1945. The first issue on it said issue three. They did that because they pretended that it was a continuance from before the war because you couldn't start new magazines after World War II because there was no paper in England, you know? The war kind of screwed a lot of stuff up, and many Americans have no idea about that, even people who were alive back then. So it came out as issue three. That was the first one. It's been around for 75 years, and it was weekly. 
new owners, 216 Sport, a professional publishing group. Wendy Sly, 84, silver medalist in 3000, who's been the publishing director, moved from Great Run Company under Brendan and Paul Foster to this. Jason Henderson is there. Jess, their online goddess, is there. Uh, the crew is there. I love these people. They, they live the sport every day. Uh, they're really good people. It's a wonderful magazine. You should have subscriptions to two athletic magazines if you are a real track fan. Track and Field News in the U.S., Athletics Weekly in the U.K. Now, Athletics Weekly has gone monthly, and it's gone big time. <clears throat> they have digital magazine. They have website. They have a clubhouse. They have paid online stuff now. Uh, they're in the 21st century. Bravo. Uh, our friend Stuart will continue writing for them. But congratulations, Wendy. Congratulations, Jason and Jess. Miss you all. Miss seeing you at meets. Uh, I'm going to have to subscribe so I can get the magazine over here. Much love. Uh, next, Scottish Athletics. You know, the, leave it to the Scots. You know, at least they could have remotely sent me haggis. In 2014, when I was there for the Commonwealth Games, I had haggis for 16 straight nights. I went to a place called Johnson's. Um, it was a it was a, a bar. It was right next to the E Hotel, and the cook in there made me a different type of haggis every day. And then a couple times I went out with Ian and Wendy and Andrew, and I had haggis with chicken and you know, and I actually liked it. People thought I was weird, but you know that's to be debated. But what the Scottish did this year was they gave they, they had a tie on the women's side. They gave it to um, Gemma Ricci, and they gave it to Laura Muir. And on the men's side, they gave it to Jake Whiteman. They gave it to Gemma because she won four out of five 800s and uh, two out of two, two out of three 1500s. Laura Muir ran three 1500s all under four minutes, including the world leader. She ran um, five 800s, her slowest being 2.00.49. Jake Whitman ran a 329.1500 and a 144.08.800. He is now faster than Steve Cram, Steve Ovet, and Seb Co. I got to say, a little off the thing, watching Hutchings and Cram speak about Jake and Monica with 1,500, and Hutchings and Crammy both saying, wow, he's number two on the list. And Hutching goes, He's ahead of you know who, and Crammy goes, uh, yes. He was ahead of you know three man. So Jake's a great guy. I've interviewed him five times. Really like him. It's not an interview with us. There's just a. It's a lot of fun. He's so relaxed. He's a. He's an incredible athlete, and I love the way he does his last two hundreds. And he comes off that turn like a bat out of friggin' hell. And he is in it. He doesn't do stupid shit in the last 200 meters. Uh, he's learned from Marcin Lewandowski and Adam Kashat and a lot of the others. And uh, he likes to think of himself as an 800, 1500 guy. He's a 1500 guy who stays in the 800, and that's what's going to help him. He should do a couple 400s too, but that's just me. Um, but Jake, congratulations. Gemma, congratulations. Laura, congratulations. Um, Coaches, uh, Jeff Whitman, Whiteman, congratulations, coaching Jake. And Andy Young, congratulations, coaching Gemma and Laura. Nice job all around. Um, Bianca Williams. Bianca Williams, you remember a few months ago, her and her um, boyfriend, uh, Ronaldo da Costa, a 400-meter runner from uh, Brazil, were accosted by five to eight police officers. They thought they were carrying drugs. And they roughed them I'm sure they roughed them up they treated them poorly Bianca got majorly pissed and it was a Black Lives Matter in Britain thank God no one was shot the investigators and a private a outside investigative group which is what they should have in the US but they didn't they don't said look these five cops should be looked at does that mean that all cops are bad? No, most cops are good. Most cops go in for the right reasons. But there are people that do stupid things, and there are good cops that make mistakes. And that's part of the situation. 
We expect superhuman things out of them, just like we expect it out of teachers. But when people do well, they should be treated well. When people don't do well, you need to figure ways to make it a, to learn from it. Um, Bianca is not happy with the way the situation is going, so stay tuned. We'll have Stuart update you on that. Um, last week, we had a 5K world record and a 10K world record. That was on Wednesday the 7th. Uh, Lend Sebet Kide ran 1406.65, breaking Chirinus Di Baba's 14.11. Tremendous run. Um, Beatrice Chepkoic kept her company through 3K, so Len Sebet had to run the last 2K on her own. She earned it. That was tough. Did the shoes help? Of course course they do. Do the artificial track help? Yeah, it's better than, uh, you know, uh, cinders. Um, much better. Does it affect the times? Of course. The shoes were approved by World Athletics. I'm still got to do some more research on this. Um, I get tired of everybody talking about the shoes. It's supposed to be about the athletes. The shoes are equipment. They're a vehicle to help you achieve your goals. Um, so 1406.65. In the men's race, Joshua Cheptegei had an even more arduous task. He was trying to break Kenanisa Bekele's world record of 27, um, 26, 17, 83. It's 15 years old. Now, Joshua Cheptegei last month ran 12.35.53, breaking the world record in the 5,000. So he's coming back in the 10. Uh, Nicholas uh, Camelli kept him company until 5K. He had two other pacemakers. They hit 5K in 1307. Cheptegei ran the la final 5K in 1304, ran 2611. Um, he didn't pass out afterwards. He was obviously tired. Did the shoes help? Of course they do. Does it make a difference in him setting the record? Of course it does. But Joshua Cheptegei was in incredible shape. He'd already run 1335. Before that, he ran a 1251 on the roads. Before that, he ran a 26, uh, 2630, 10K on the roads. Before that, he ran a 15K, 4120. For the last 18 months, this guy has been getting better and better and stronger and stronger. He's impressive. He's got them wheels. So Joshua Chapter Guy, congratulations. And then on this Saturday, uh, Safan Hassan in the rain ran a new European record of 29.35, breaking the 30.01 record by Paula Radcliffe. She did it in a hellacious rainstorm. Safan Hassan, you earned that puppy. Congratulations. Yos Hermans, the man behind all the meets and his team at Global Sports Communications, great job. We needed these events. Is it just someone going out and saying, I'm going to set a world record and whoopee? No. You have to know these athletes are in great shape. Things can go wrong, and they do all the time. These are both perfect storms. Great facilities, people tested, uh, people tested who were racing, who were pacing, and these athletes did it the old-fashioned way. One took off with a half to go. The other one took off after 40% to go. It was just, again, amazing. Pandemic. How are we doing the pandemic? Uh, U.S., what, it's a 25 of 50 states. Numbers are up. We had 57,000 positive tests yesterday. We're going back into Wisconsin in a week, and um, they're getting more and more positives. Um, wherever you're at, you got to take care of yourself. You wash your hands for 20 seconds. You wear a mask inside and out when you're outside and you can't be six feet separated i really think you should be nine to twelve feet separated um wear a mask you can be patriotic wearing a mask you're masculine wearing a mask you know what you're really doing you're taking care of everybody else you're not putting yourself first and being a little narcissistic shit okay this is not a republican issue this is not a democratic issue you know um i still re respect republicans and i still respect democrats I can disagree with you politically. I don't have to hate you. This is what the current leader now knows that by doing that and dividing this great country, that's when we're at our weakest. 
do me a favor. Someone you absolutely abhor their politics about, think of something positive about them. Okay? Remember to be human. It's healthy. All right. Last thing. Anything else? Um, no events this week. Uh, I'm going to be posting some great video. Um, we get to talk to Yos Hermans this week about his meets. I'm trying to get Tom Jordan to chat with us as well. And we'll be posting some things from Tiana Bartoletto, Christian Taylor, um, Jay Quitman, Whiteman. Um, and then I'm going to try to get some other athletes too and some coaches. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is Athletics Chat number 22. This is the epilogue. If you like us, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like us, like us, like us. If you love us, if your heart just stops when you don't, see us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, go to the YouTube and subscribe. Hey, I've got some great music lists too. Actually, Mikey's done amazing music lists. My stuff's like kind of classic rock and weird alternative stuff. But um, thank you again to Mike Deering for dealing with me on a daily basis. Thank you to Mike Deering and Adam Johnson Eater for coming up with the ideas for this programming and convincing me to do it. Um, and uh, thank you to my dear brother for maintaining Run Blog Run and being my partner there and encouraging me to put stuff up and have fun. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run signing off. Stay safe.